All right, this is the College of Complexes, and we've got another evening of debate and discussion, and uh, we don't have our speaker yet, but uh, Mo should be here shortly. Uh, Mo Shanfield will be uh, talking to us, at least he's scheduled to be, uh, on do black Americans fear getting shot more since uh, the Zimmerman decision. And uh, Mo has spoken here before, uh, not recently, but, but from time to time. And aside from uh, selling me Chicago Tribunes, he's uh, a pretty good speaker. Without any further ado, we will hear from our speaker tonight, Mo Shanfield. You do that all the time, Charlie. What the heck? I failed to give uh, Charlie or Bram <clears throat> an introduction for me, so I'll do my own introduction. Uh, in uh, three years, I will celebrate my 75th anniversary of campaigning, political campaigning on the streets of Chicago. Uh, in, 19, in spring of 1941, I drew up, as I used to love to do, scenes of war, tanks, shooting, soldiers, etc. But this time, over each one, I wrote, uh, Keep America Out of War, and I went to the corner of Farwell and Greenview and handed out maybe a dozen of them. Um, then when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked, I was converted from isolationism to interventionism, and I participated in the war effort by uh, selling uh, war stamps door to door and collecting uh, scrap metal and paper. Uh, I was the executive director of Voters for Peace in a, in a sort of abort, aborted or aborted uh, anti-nuclear campaign in 1962. Uh, Chuck Percy and I cooperated uh, in defeating that super hawk, Senator Douglas, during the Vietnam War. If you want details of that, look at uh, the July 5th, 1966 Sun-Times, page two. There's a three-column picture of Chuck Percy and me coming out of the Chicago Avenue Police Station together. Um, and uh, I've been in, uh, oh yeah, and then of course I was the uh, Green Party candidate for Congress in the 9th District, running against Jan Schakowsky in the 2008. And I was quite humbled to get a 3,990 votes <laughs> because I really hadn't run much of a campaign aside from appearing on Channel 11 for two minutes. Um, Jan Schakowsky got about 170,000, I think. The Republican may have gotten about 40,000. <coughs> but I was humbled by those people who uh, voted for me really without knowing me. They were voting for the, for the Green Party uh, alternative. Um, I've got to apologize for the worst headline in the history of the College of Complexes, I think. The headline uh, announcing my, uh, my speech. Oh, uh, all right. It was a little long. The reader didn't print it. They just said I was going to talk on the Zimmerman case. Uh, I, I had a, an intuition that there was a lot of significance to be gotten out of the Zimmerman case, and the injustice of it bothered me. Uh, but I was sort of confused. In working on my speech, I, I really learned a lot. You, you really learn more uh, teaching than you do uh, listening to a teacher. So I, I think I've got at least an idea figured out. And I want to start by referring to uh, page you, with one of the Chicago Tribune, Several days after the Zimmerman uh, verdict came down, there was a demonstration downtown of people against the Zimmerman verdict and the uh, three or four column photograph on page one of the Tribune showed a young black woman holding up a sign. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact word, but the message of her sign was, I'm innocent, don't shoot me. I think that she represented 
the uh, tip of the iceberg in uh, the black community and their concern about uh, the unleashing of many Zimmermans in this country. I mean, they're, they're around, but the, the door has been opened up a little bit more for them. Um, and that has been done by a one-two punch of the uh, concealed carry law laws and the same ground laws. Uh, Florida has both. Uh, I haven't followed the Illinois legislature. I think it's about to pass a concealed carry law for Illinois. Uh, I'm not aware that anyone is introducing a standard ground law in, in Illinois. Uh, and these uh, two laws, uh, oh yeah, Illinois will become, would, if, if it passes that law, it will become either the 49th or 50th state with a concealed carry. Um, Danger ground that has been passed in about 25 states due to the efforts of ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, which is funded by the good old Koch brothers, who uh, fund uh, right wing, the election of right wing governors, uh, mostly in the Midwest. And so it's hard to say which came first, the, the increased popularity of carrying guns or owning guns, or this new legislation. Uh, but one thing is for sure, the nation is more disunified today than at any time since the Civil War. And I remember this nation when it was unified. Um, I went to see Abbott and Costello in um, uh, Buck Privates, which amused me when I was 10 years old. I thought it would abuse me again. I didn't find it quite so funny. But when I came into the auditorium, there was a, um, a strange movie on. It was like a vaudeville show. I think Bob Hope was the MC, very young Bob Hope. And uh, I remember Jenny Sims. Anybody remember Jenny Sims? She was a songbird of the 40s, but I'm sure you all remember Harpo Marx. He was one of the entertainers. It was just a series of hacks, and I was wondering, what Hollywood category is this? And finally, it was revealed to me by the pitch. The pitch was for defense bonds or war bonds. Um, if it was, if, I think it may have been defense bonds. I think this... Uh, uh, short was made before Pearl Harbor, when of course they changed the name of defense bonds to war bonds. When I heard what the film was about, I cried. Because that was 1966, I think, and the nation was extremely disunified over the uh, Iraq war, which was obviously going very badly at the time. And I was contributing to the disunity by participating in the peace demonstrations. So I was very aware that the nation was very disunified and that uh, film took, took me back, courtesy of Bob Hope, to a time when I felt the unity of the nation. Uh, but still, why, why this popularity of guns? I think the disunity of the nation contributes to it, um, but the specific factor, I think, that has caused more people to get guns is the fear of a total collapse of the society. Now, we used to have survivalists who were a fairly small group, and they did their own thing, and this is more widespread. And there's a, a point of agreement between the right and the left on um, some kind of coming disaster. As you probably are aware, the right tends to emphasize the national debt and inflation, and of course they attribute the national debt to uh, 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 food stamp cheats. <laughs> uh, they don't say a word about the subsidy to the oil companies or the, uh, the munitions companies. The left, at least portions of the left, have been focusing on other causes that could lead to a collapse of the economy. 
uh, it's, it's a little bit more complex. They talk about, and we talk about, I talk about global warming, uh, the pollution of uh, farmland, the destruction of uh, aquifers, peak oil leading to inflation, uh, the, the, the divide between the rich and the poor, uh, the increase in the power of droughts, hurricanes, and floods, which uh, that the scientists at Na Na NASA, who's probably the leading expert on climate climatology, James, his name is James Harris, uh, attributes for that, to global warming. You, could have you sure? Yeah, you want some have. singles there? Uh, no. The, this unity of the left and right is demonstrated almost every day on radio station WCPT when uh, Tom Hartman and Ed Schwartz, Ed Schultz, is that his name, um, each present in their own voice a commercial for buying gold. And as is well known, when societies collapse, the value of their currency collapses, it's hard to say which comes first, but gold always maintains value. It's nice to have a little gold around. Uh, if your currency is going to become virtually valueless, uh, Tom Hartman's commercial for buying gold is uh, focuses on the Congress's lack of action on jobs, and it's the lack of jobs is dragging the economy down, and that's what's threatening uh, a total collapse. Ed Schwartz actually mentions the 16 trillion dollar debt. So he, he, he begins to sound like, a, I call him Ed Schwartz, he's Ed Schultz, isn't it? Um, he begins to sound like a, a, a right winger, and he says the $16 trillion debt will lead to a, a, the collapse. He doesn't mention the $16 trillion debt ever that I have heard in his, you know, in his regular discussions, but that's his pitch uh, for gold. Still, why carry guns? I don't think... Uh, anyone who carries a gun doesn't have buried somewhere in their consciousness or subconsciousness uh, an image of a potential enemy or villain that they're going to have to defend against. Uh, there's very few people who are uh, carrying guns, especially handguns, to hunt deer, rabbits, or squirrels. So what I want to do is get a grant from the foundation, I think about 20 million will do it, to take about uh, a thousand uh, gun owners and, and stick an electrode in their brain and bring out the, imi the image, which may be in their subconscious, of the villain that is scaring them. That, why, that's the reason that they think they, they need a gun. And project that image onto a screen but average the images out, and I think if you did that, you'd find that the skin color of that potential villain is maybe within a few shades of Barack Obama, lighter or darker. <laughs> and that, there is a connection to um, the uh, Zimmerman not guilty verdict. Uh, we are getting manifestations of a racism that is more per pervasive and more subtle than the racism of the South. Uh, my sister, who is now 94, uh, was a 20-year-old 20, 20 youngster back in 1941 when she traveled in the South with her, uh, oh no, she was 22, uh, with her husband who was selling jewelry to jewelry stores. And she was totally amazed and shocked to see uh, white only, colored only signs and all this segregation. She'd been raised in Chicago and she didn't know a thing about it. Uh, well, the, the schools are supposedly not segregated in the South. They certainly are segregated in Chicago. Um, but the context of the Zimmerman uh, verdict of not guilty comes out at just the right time uh, to promote the crisis. And here's the way it works. The, uh, let's start with the Zimmerman trial. George Zimmerman was found not guilty by reason of self-defense. Everybody knows that. 
But there, something happened in that trial that has never happened in a trial where self-defense was pled at any time in the last thousand years of Anglo-Saxon history. Here's what happened. In order to plead self-defense, guess what you have to do? You have to get up there and plead self-defense. I know plead is a, can be another word for testify. The, uh, the defendant who says that he uh, felt in danger of life or limb and he had no means of escape, um, he's going to say this. If George Zimmerman had gotten on the stand to say that, his attorney would have uh, questioned him with some very well-rehearsed questions, and there's nothing wrong with that. They do it all the time. And uh, maybe Zimmerman could have presented uh, a reasonable testimony that might be convincing to, to a majority of the jury. The trouble is that when he finished, when he would finish that testimony, he couldn't get off the stand. He has to remain on the stand for the prosecuting attorney to sail in his direction and start a cross-examination. I think Zimmerman knew, and his lawyer was, knew very well, that Zimmerman was not too sharp, and he had contradicted himself in testimony or reporting to the police. So they, I, I think they came to the conclusion very early that if Zimmerman was cross-examined by a halfway competent prosecutor, he would be found guilty because his story did not hang together. But if you don't get on the stand, you cannot enter the plea of self-defense. That's a dilemma. Now, the strange thing that happened was that dilemma was rescued by another dilemma. <laughs> it was the dilemma of the prosecuting attorney. He had a dilemma, too. He knew that the nation was demanding the prosecution of um, George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman had shot an un unarmed young man who didn't just happen to be black. Those are the kinds of people that uh, George Zimmerman always was following, but they have police records of that. Uh, he shot an unarmed young black man named Trayvon Martin, and I feel like crying when I say his name. Uh, there was no disputing this. He confessed it to the police. So if, if the prosecutor, in order to, uh, to suck up to the racists in his southern community, had decided not to prosecute uh, George Zimmerman, there would have been a national storm and a lot of people would have started to boycott Florida. Certainly the NAACP wouldn't hold any more conventions there, but there'd be a lot of other organizations. Uh, and his community in particular would be under severe pressure. So he would be blamed by his own community for bringing all this trouble down on them. And a lot of national attention, uh, more than they wanted to get. On the other hand, if he prosecuted George Zimmerman and he got a conviction, then the racists in his community would be even more angry at him and he'd lose the next election. So he had a dilemma. He found the solution to his dilemma, which solved the dilemma of the defense at the same time. He prosecuted George Zimmerman, and then he took the police tapes like something like videotapes or digital tapes, on which George Zimmerman tells his story and asserts that he was defending himself, he entered those tapes into the court record. So that George Zimmerman's plea of self-defense is not entered by his testimony on the stand, but is entered electronically. Um, of course, they didn't have electronics uh, 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, very much. But uh, this will be the first time that, <clears throat> that I know of in legal history <clears throat> that, uh, 
that someone was able to enter the plea of self-defense without being subjected to cross-examination. The prosecuting attorney rescued George Zimmerman and his attorney from their dilemma by solving his own dilemma. The judge should have ruled this procedure out of order. There's several different ways in which he, he could have done that. But that's a legal detail. So I, I would assert there was a conspiracy between the whole bunch of them. George Zimmerman, his attorney, the prosecuting attorney, and the judge. Uh, might be difficult to prove that in court, but it's quite evident to me. You know, when he walks like a duck and talks like a duck, etc. So this is a racist conspiracy. The other big issue in the trial is who had the right of self-defense? Now, children are very wise. And when you see two children fighting and you go to break up the fight, there's a good chance one of them will say, he started it. The child may not even know the term self-defense, but he knows that uh, he, by engaging in the fight, he is more in the right if he was not the one who started it. Uh, it's an instinctive uh, grasp for the right of self-defense. But two people cannot simultaneously uh, claim self-defense against each other. So who had the right of self-defense? Has anyone here ever walked down a dark, lonely street and heard footsteps behind them? or behind you, or seeing a, a figure that you are somehow imagining might be a little threatening. Anyone have had that experience? There's at least one out of how many? Two, three. Millions of Americans have had that experience, particularly women. That was the experience that it apparently Trayvon Martin had. George Zimmerman's own testimony and his telephone call to the police are evidence that he spent several minutes uh, tracking Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin is thinking, who is this big white guy following him and what is he up to? Now, beyond that, we don't know anything except what uh, George Zimmerman said. Unfortunately, there wasn't a third witness, but it's easy to imagine that Trayvon Martin being a fairly uh, athletic young man decided that his best defense against this threat was to attack George Zimmerman. But we don't even know that the attack occurred. It may not have, there may not have been an attack. And here's part of the, re part of the evidence for there not having been an attack by Trayvon Martin. At least not the kind of attack that George Zimmerman was describing. George Zimmerman, in his testimony to the police, said that he, George Zimmerman, was lying on the ground, not his back. And Trayvon Martin was smacking him and beating him. Uh, his wounds don't, don't substantiate his description. Let that pass. George Zimmerman says he was able to get the gun out of his pocket or someplace, and apparently his claim is that Trayvon Martin wasn't able to snatch the gun out of his hand, and he shot Trayvon Martin in the heart as it happened. Maybe his aim was very good. Well, I advise you never to do that because in that position, <clears throat> you'll be nearly drowned in blood. There wasn't a speck of blood on George Zimmerman's shirt, front, jacket, face, anywhere where he might have landed. So, we have quite a, a conspiracy in the court based upon standard ground. Um, and what this does is the standard ground law actually empowers um, any citizen with the powers that have up until this point in history been exclusively reserved for the police. That is, when you are threatened, if you want to exercise the right of self-defense, the first thing you better do is see if you have a means of escape. If you have a means of escape, take that. Take that route. Get the hell out of there. 
we don't want any more murders that we're killing that, that we can uh, have, uh, avoid. That's the duty of a citizen. If, uh, if in pleading self-defense, the court comes to the conclusion that you had an opportunity to escape, you didn't have to use deadly force to protect yourself, you lose the right of self-defense. Police are obviously operating under a different set of rules. When there's a fight and someone is threatened, a robbery, what have you, and the police arrive, it's not the job of the police to escape if they can. Uh, <clears throat> if one person is threatening another with a gun, <clears throat> it's the duty of the police to try and prevent that shooting. Maybe they have to shoot the guy who had the gun. But the fact that they had an opportunity to escape is totally irrelevant. So the police are different than an ordinary citizen. Stand your ground says to every citizen, particularly white citizens, you are now empowered with police powers. And this is a preparation for the revival of the slave patrol. It's little, and Tom Hartman has done a good job of explaining this, it's a little understood that um, the, um, the, uh, the Second Amendment, the right of citizens to bear arms in order to have a well-maintained militia, that word militia meant one thing in Massachusetts where the militia had fought the Redcoats. It meant something different in Georgia, Virginia, Mississippi, etc. Mississippi wasn't so well settled at that time, but the South. <clears throat> what it meant in the South was slave patrols. In every community uh, that had any, any number of slaves to speak of, and there were parts of the South that didn't get slaves, like in North Georgia, um, <clears throat> every citizen had a duty, every white citizen, I should say, had a duty to participate in the slave patrols which of course was looking for runaway slaves, wandering slaves, and uh, there probably is no record of how many uh, black people were killed by those slave patrols. <coughs> it probably rivals the height of, um, of lynching in this country. Uh, so in the South, that word militia meant slave patrols. The Zimmerman decision is a step toward reconstituting the slave patrols. Now, we don't have slavery. We don't need patrols for that. I'll tell you what we do have. We have a world economic system and an American economic system teetering on the brink. One of the brinks that we're teetering on is the price of oil. The Pentagon, uh, I don't know if they issued it, but they had a report about two years ago that world, total world oil production was going to go down 14% uh, by uh, 2020, I think. This report was not reported anywhere in the mainstream American press. It was reported by that left-wing publication, The Guardian, in England, and the Pentagon confirmed that they had conducted this study. And if I know the Pentagon, they probably spent a million dollars in this study. <clears throat> With the increasing demand for oil, not only in this country, not only in Western Europe, but now in China and India, especially China, the fastest growing economy in, in history, mm -hmm. uh, that 14% decline in total production is going to produce some very severe shortages. And that's why the elite, the American elite, are pressing to uh, for the, uh, uh, the extraction of oil from the Canadian oil sands. That's a new, uh, a new source that perhaps the Pentagon didn't take into account, but it isn't going to last very long. Incidentally, it's not going to, even if they do it, even if they bring all that oil down from the pipeline, the pipeline is going to New Orleans, not to the refineries in Oklahoma, it's going to China. It's not going to, as a matter of fact, it will actually increase gasoline prices, at least in the Midwest, not decrease them. But uh, we could be here all night if we start talking about the lies of the oil companies 
and, uh, and the right wing. Okay, when you get uh, severe increases in the price of oil, that will of course mean a great increase in the uh, price of the diesel fuel that farmers use in their tractors to, for the great American crops to be produced. Those crops will be in danger. And to get an idea of the nature of that danger and how close we are to the edge, has anyone here ever been on a country road <clears throat> or highway and been uh, shunted aside by uh, a, a state police uh, checkpoint that demands that you get onto the um, shoulder and await a convoy? It's a convoy usually of about 100 huge semis going at about 80 miles an hour. This is a convoy fueled not only by gasoline, but by desperation. They've got to get the crop to the mills in time to keep the supply of food up to par in this country. The world once had, and that's why they have these fantastic high-speed convoys. Um, the world once had a backlog of 150 days of uh, food, mostly grains, that had been reduced to 50 days. So we're very close to this break. And naturally, the government is not going to let the country starve completely. Uh, we'll have rationing, price controls, and al uh, special allocations of fuel to the farmers. But there will be food shortages. When those food shortages develop, the food supply is controlled by the white corporations. They're going to see to it that their favorite neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, are the ones who get the first pick of the food. Uh, the black neighborhoods may begin to find they're a little short on food. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know how far this conflict will go, but it could lead to uh, some pretty violent protests. And if you're going to have violent protests by a lot of black people, you need a white militia to take care of them. That's just one example of the, how the um, impending disasters um, can, can lead to severe racial conflict. And, uh, and that's why the corporate elite in this country wants to make sure we have a strong white militia. And the Zimmerman decision may have been accidental, but it feeds right into that, that goal. And uh, in a way, it's fortunate because it calls our attention to this uh, coming crisis. Um, so, oh yeah. I want to end on a positive note of good news. Thanks to Pope Francis, he provided us with some good news this week. He said that we shouldn't get the Catholic Church should stop being so negative about people who practice abortion, homosexuality, and contraception, and focus on healing and mercy. Uh, that's one point of. Uh, of good news. Uh, another point of good news is I think either, I think Tom Hartman pointed this out, the left in the Democratic Party at least has resisted some of the rightward moves of uh, President Obama, such as uh, the appointment of um, Larry uh, Summers, uh, when several left-wing senators uh, started to voice objections. Uh, Barack and uh, Larry withdrew the uh, nomination very quickly. Um, another one is the resistance of starting a third, of getting involved in a third war uh, in the Middle East. And there were several other points that he made. So I think we'll be able to take better advantage of all the good news if we coolly and objectively examine all the bad news that's threatening us. Thank you. Ron, do your thing. Well, <laughs> uh, 
We're headed for imminent collapse of the economy, correct? Well, it depends on how you define the word imminent. Uh, it could be a year, it could be 15 years. Actually, it's beyond. Uh, the intensity of the hurricanes brought economic as well as personal devastation to New Orleans and the East Coast. Uh, the droughts and the flood and floods in the Midwest have uh, brought economic devastation to areas uh, in the Midwest and their is every evidence that these um, natural catastrophes are going to increase in power as global warming increases? Just to speculate real quick, if we found an alternate source of main baseload electric power, could this collapse be averted? Uh, what, what was that phrase you used of what? Of main base electrical power. What do you mean by main base? Um, power plants? Yeah. Uh, we did a lecture here a couple weeks ago on thorium and yeah. its implications. Uh, if, if we could be successful with that, do you think it might avert the collapse? I made a speech on that subject about seven or eight years ago here at the college, where I said, let's do what we did in World War II. On December the 8th, December the 7th, 1941, unemployment was 10.5%. During January, the Roosevelt administration started signing contracts with General Motors, General Electric, and all the rest of the big corporations in $2,008. The total value of the contracts they signed was $7 trillion. And that was an economy with 10% of the people unemployed. By December the 7th, 19. Uh, 42, unemployment was one and a half percent. But more, even more important, uh, pertinent to your question, instead of producing guns, tanks, and planes, we could produce solar and wind power equipment, electric cars, and achieve it precisely the end that uh, you're pointing to. And it could be done with amazing rapidity. When Roosevelt called a bunch of uh, manufacturers to a meeting in the White House and said that he needed uh, 50,000 planes a year or something like that. One of them said, that's impossible. And Roosevelt said, oh, I forgot to tell you, you won't be producing automobiles or refrigerators anymore. And of course, what we would do in this case would be to um, uh, switch entirely from producing um, internal combustion automobiles to electric automobiles. And interestingly enough, Elliot Spitzer, in a debate on uh, National Public Radio about three or four years ago, said, the government owns General Motors. Why doesn't the government simply order General Motors to switch 600,000 cars a year? I don't know where he got that figure, 600,000 is a fair figure, 
600,000 cars from internal combustion to electric cars and start producing electric cars. So there's a little bit of a tendency to move in the kind of direction you're referring to. I got on Channel 11 for two minutes, thanks to Channel 11 when I ran for Congress, and I laid out this plan. Um, it didn't cause a ripple. At least I wasn't uh, nearly lynched like the, the doctor in An Enemy of the People by Ibsen. Right. Yeah, uh, as we all know, Karl Marx said the defect was in the capital system. He said, I don't have to blow you up. I don't have to what? No, no, I'm, I'm, that, I'm, that's my emphasis. In other words, Karl Marx said capitalism, what we call capitalism, is defective. And you can't, nobody got to shoot gun for that system to collapse. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. Okay, now, I wasn't living with Karl Marx, but you were living, and I was living when Wall Street did more damage to the <coughs> system mm -hmm. than I believed that the defect could do. Yeah. I want you to come in on the contrast there. With Karl Marx, the defect is more... Uh, what was the word after Karl Marx? More forceful? Part of my, I, my hearing is a little bad. The contrast between Karl Marx's and sound like you said defect. Yeah, in yeah. other words, other words, Karl Marx, whether well, he used defect, I, I don't know. But I, I've read Karl Marx. Yeah, I'm just looking for the word, but that's yeah, okay. yeah, it, I get your general drift. It's built into the system. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the falsehood is built into the system, and the yeah. system over time will collapse. Yeah. I'm saying that I'm living, you live it, I want you to come here yeah. to me. What Wall Street did in the last 20 years is more threat to the system than what Karl Marx said. Now, you were living, I was living. Would you come in on that? Yeah. Uh, well, the first, I, I have two comments right off the, before even thinking about it. Number one, Wall Street did more damage to popular capitalism than the communists have ever done, but it built up centralized, monopolistic, oligopolistic capitalism. The corporations today, even while the population is, uh, its income is going down, the corporations are sitting on the biggest pile of money in the history of the world. Uh, so from their point of view, uh, capitalism is successful. Uh, if Karl Marx were alive today, he'd probably shake his finger at them and say, you're, you're digging your own grave. Uh, and I'm not sure who's necessarily right, uh, because I predicted, even 50 years ago, that this country was being turned into a third world nation. Uh, and that is really what has been happening. Uh, after World War II, the capitalists had an, a, a wonderful opportunity. You had all these guys coming back from the army with some savings. People had the war bonds they had purchased. Um, the economy started really to Zoom, and these people wanted to buy cars and homes, and we all know what happened in the 50s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. Um, the American domestic market was the basis of, the, of that success of the capitalists. So when uh, Charlie Wilson of General Motors said, what's good for General Motors is good for America, he was right up to a point. That's no longer true. What is happening now? Well, there's one. There's another. Besides those uh, convoys, there's another dramatic event that has been happening all across America that the press does not report, and that is there are midnight raids on American industry. When a, a plant shuts, certain plants shut down. After they've been shut down for a little while, there's a midnight raid on, on the plant where. Uh, workmen and engineers come in and package up all the equipment for shipment to China. While they're doing this, they have armed guards around the outside of the plant to make sure no one intrudes on them and sees what they're doing. This has been kept out of the mainstream press, and I don't know what percentage of American industrial machinery has been shipped to China and gotten into what other countries. If, if German saboteurs had been doing this during World War II and we caught them, we would have strung them up by the neck. 
But this treason goes on under our eyes. So capitalism in this country, uh, medium-sized capitalists make a lot of business. The, um, the financiers, oh yeah, the finance capital, it finds it very easy to transfer funds all over the world. And where they're going to wind up living, I don't know. But when the American market is no longer one of the top markets for consumer goods, uh, they won't be too worried about America anymore. It can sink into its third world status. So, um, barring a huge catastrophe like global warming really um, disrupting everything, um, I, I'm inclined to see uh, the survival of finance capital, maybe not so much the survival of industrial capital. Yeah, when you were talking about the Zimmerman case, you mentioned uh, a couple of things about self-defense. Uh -huh. And one of the things you mentioned was if somebody pleads self-defense, they got to somehow show that there was no way for them to escape. Yeah. Well, no, technically, they, it isn't as they have to show it. If the prosecutor, prosecutor no, introduces a claim that they had a means of self-defense, then they have to defend against that claim. They don't have to prove in advance that they have no means of self-defense. Well, what, what I'm getting at is the idea that a, a, a person having a, a chance to escape. Again, it seems to me that if someone is attacked, I don't, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm not no, trying to argue right. with the law, but yeah. it seems to me that if someone is attacked, yeah. that they don't have any obligation to run. It seems to me they should be able to stand up for themselves and defend themselves. When they well, then you're a supporter of stand your ground. I won't use that phrase. What? I won't use that phrase. Yeah, but that's what applies to it. That's, that's what it really well, it amounts to. It seems to me that if, if somebody attacks you and you stand up yeah. and you beat the hell out of the guy, it's just tough shit for him. <coughs> even, well, if you're uh, right, like, even if you're right out there on the intersection, you could run. You could run in any direction. Maybe the law happens to disagree with you. Uh, until until we until we pass until a, until a state passes the stand your ground law, a thousand years of Anglo-Saxon law says that you are not empowered to just attack or kill someone uh, regardless of of your opportunity to escape. The law wants to minimize uh, uh, extra legal killings. If someone is to be killed, the law wants to do it their way, by a formal execution. They don't want people executing people on the street. Yeah. So if you have an opportunity, this is the law. I mean, you are entitled to your position, but uh, uh, until stand your ground laws are passed by each legislature as a result of the Alec conspiracy, uh, a thousand years of Anglo-Saxon law says that you have a duty to get the hell out of there if there is any way of doing so before uh, counterattack. Well, thanks for explaining that. Now, I'm going to say I'm not taking a shot at you. Yeah. But I think that philosophy is just bogus. Right? Uh -huh. I really do. Okay. I think if somebody attacks you and you just wail the hell out of the guy, it's tough shit for him. Well, I think <laughs> you're you're it's asserting uh, you're asserting street justice. No, absolutely not. It doesn't matter if it's on the street or in his restaurant. Well, uh, it's human justice. All right, call it that. Extra legal justice. It's not extra legal. <laughs> It, 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 didn't, it, didn't well, go, me. it didn't go it through a court. It probably is extra legal, but it shouldn't be. Oh, it shouldn't be. Now, that's a different matter. Yeah. Okay. You, you need to go and debate. Yeah. Uh, and I think... Yeah. And I'm not trying to I don't see, no, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with a thousand years of Anglo-Saxon law. I agree, and exactly. You're, and you're, you have an ally that you don't want to acknowledge because you don't like the term stand your ground. But that, you're saying not only stand your ground, but beat the hell out of the guy as well. So if he's trying to beat the hell out of you, I say, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Okay, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, Ernie? Oh, yeah. uh, Charles. Charles okay. doesn't have a question. Oh, uh, Mo, you, you, you said there's upcoming food shortages, but I understand what percentage of grain goes to make gasoline. Oh, yeah. I mean, are they going to continue to produce gasoline when oh. there's food shortages? I think uh, mostly you, they use corn for that, don't they? Yeah, but I mean, if people are hungry, I mean... Yeah. I mean, are they going to be making gasoline instead of... I, I, I don't have an idea on that, exactly what's going to happen. A lot, a lot of different things could happen. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, yes, Ernie? Yeah, uh, Mo, can you describe uh, the difference between second degree murder, which oh. is what the charge was and the trial was about? Oh, I Manslaughter. I can't. And then there was a third. Yeah, I don't know the differences there. You don't. There's manslaughter. Well, the yeah, before, uh, unless you, the lesser char charge after manslaughter is felonious assault. Okay. You know, can you know the difference between any of those? No, I don't. And then there was a third thing that the judge brought up in the last minute, something about violating the rights of a minor. I don't know if anybody remembers oh, I, that. But I missed it, that one too. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll talk about that later. If, but you don't know the technical. No, I don't. I know that. We got somebody who does. Gene. <clears throat> Different states word it differently. Uh -huh. Murder right. is premeditated. That's first degree, uh, right? Yeah, that's first degree murder. Yeah. Okay. In, they, in some states they call it second degree murder. Right. In Illinois, I believe that comes under uh, uh, manslaughter. Okay. So there's no second degree murder yeah. in Illinois? No. I'm, I'm trying to explain. All right. Second degree murder in X state might be manslaughter. Uh, in this state. Then you have a third branch called in, in, uh, involuntary. involuntary manslaughter. So that would be three right there. Okay. But each state by law can write their constitution words that fit their state. I don't have to imitate anybody else. So that might be the different when you go to one state to the other one. But most of them got at least three laws, categories, when it comes to somebody being killed by another person. All right. Well, the one in the middle, second. You know what second degree manslaughter in Florida is? That's kind of the one in the middle between first degree and manslaughter. I, I believe uh, uh, manslaughter would would, would uh, cover that in Illinois. Okay. Like I said, uh, manslaughter, second degree murder might be interchangeable as far as words go. You kill somebody, but you don't intend to. You kill somebody. No, manslaughter, second degree murder is higher than. Then, then, uh, manslaughter. No, no, no. I'm saying if they use them as, if the words is interchangeable, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's just a different word. However, that's, that's three categories. Involuntary manslaughter yeah. is, is the weakest one of them. Yeah. Second degree murder or manslaughter yeah. is the middle. Yeah. And then you have a uh, premeditated uh, a murder. murder. So yeah. what, is, what does it take to fit that middle category? In other words, premeditated, we understand what that is because of the way it's described. Manslaughter is presumably or involuntary manslaughter. So what, what do you have to do to get in the middle? Manslaughter would be you didn't intend to kill the guy. Uh -huh. In other words, there's evidence that you didn't intend what you did. For instance, you hit him in the, in the, in the chin and he fell back on the counter and he's yeah. dead. Yeah. You That's did it. Yeah. But you didn't mean, you didn't say, I'm going to hit your head and you're going to die tonight, mother. Yeah, I'm well, saying, that's involuntary manslaughter. No, that would be um, uh, manslaughter, manslaughter, as I remember. I think that, is, that involves, uh, when you, for instance, when you're fighting someone, mm -hmm. and it's a, it seems to be a normal fight. Well, like the Koshman case on, uh, on uh, uh, Division Street, it's been in the Sun Times for four years, uh, this big uh, relative of Mayor Daly knocked his little kid down and the kid hit his head on the stone and uh, later died of the fracture. Um, there was no intention to kill, but there was a moral responsibility. Then below that, I, I, I know this much, if you're driving and you uh, hit someone and you kill them, the, uh, uh, the issue that comes up in the court is were you driving in reckless disregard of that person's safety or safety in general. If the guy had just rushed out in front of the car and you couldn't stop, uh, they, maybe they wouldn't even charge you. But if you were driving in some uh, unpredictable wild fashion and you hit someone, then you have a moral responsibility for the consequence even though you didn't intend to kill anybody. Okay, Charles. Yeah, Mo, I, I got the sense that you were against like increased police patrols. But mm -hmm. I just read in the news, and many people did, that 
we've got a lot of violence taking place in yeah. the city. Yeah. And I I don't I don't know. How do you how do you reduce violence well, without I don't recall I don't recall that. Law, law enforcement. I don't know what I said that said I'm against increased police patrols, but I'm not too happy with the Chicago police. I have personally witnessed the Chicago police uh, committing crimes against people where they were uh, injuring them. Uh, and we have quite a few cases of the Chicago police shooting someone where it was questionable uh, whether the Chicago police were under any threat. Um, the the, the long-term solution to uh, crime in Chicago is jobs for everybody. Um, I heard, uh, oh, what's that old Chicago politician who's on WCPT, um, the something report, he was saying, oh, the problem is in the homes they don't have discipline, they don't teach morals, blah, blah, blah. When you're in a home with one or two unemployed parents and you, your education is really worthless in this economy, and on top of that, you're discriminated against for your skin color. I don't entirely blame these guys for going into dealing drugs. They have nothing else available to them. It's just, uh, I, I don't think that the people on the North Shore are morally uh, superior in their genes to the people in the ghetto, but somehow they don't, they don't have much violence and they don't have much drug dealing. They don't need it. They're making money by shuffling paper around. Uh, they've had the, the opportunity. So to, to uh, blame, it's a case of blaming the victim. And increased police patrols may sometimes produce a good effect, sometimes not. It's not really dealing with the problem. Yeah, to get back to the politics we were on for a while, I, I wonder what your take is on the Republicans now with their, uh, uh, they're going to try to shut down the government uh, huh. deal here. Are they going to follow through on that? Or? Uh, my take on them is my take on any maniac. Um, I heard, um, again, it was either Ed Schultz or Tom Hartman reading the platform of the uh, Texas Republican Party. They want to eliminate Social Security, unemployment compensation, and completely eliminate the minimum wage. Um, this, is, uh, this, this is the capitalists giving up on the uh, uh, American <coughs> consumer market. There's still a pretty good consumer market from uh, the upper middle class, but they see the end coming. And they see greater opportunities in investing their money in China or someplace. They don't want to invest, invest uh, money in the working class or the lower middle class as we did with the GI Bill after World War II. That was, uh, I forgot to mention that. It was one of the greatest programs for uh, helping people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. The, the capitalists who provide the money for the Republican Party want to cut their expenses. They don't want to pay taxes for um, uh, food stamps, unemployment compensation, even Social Security. The Texas Republican Party wants to eliminate Social Security. Oh yeah, there's one advantage the capitalists will get from that. All that money that people are saving for their retirement well, most of it will probably go to Wall Street. It'll be a tremendous boost for Wall Street. That's the main thing that they see that they can get from the, the remnants of the uh, American uh, uh, middle class. So I, I see them, I see them as really traitors. And it's an, oh yeah, and Tom Hartman played or after he enlisted <laughs> the uh, the platform of the Texas Republican Party, he played a recording of Eisenhower. Or Eisenhower, I think she's in the campaign of 56, Eisenhower is boasting of the fact that the Republican Party increased the minimum wage and did various things to help unions, and I forget all the details. Eisenhower was to the left of Obama. Um, 
Uh, that Republican Party is born. Are, are they going to follow through on shutting down the government? I this you know I I don't carefully study the ins and outs of Washington politics. I don't have any special insight on that. I, I'd like to know why it is that with high unemployment, and even now it's over seven percent. The U.S. government is not opening up jobs. There's lots to be done, lots of needful. How would you propose that? How would you propose the U.S. government open up jobs? Well, as the way uh, the U.S. government opens up jobs uh, during the depression. Okay, WPA, uh, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. I'm with you. Well, you're asking why not? I think I just gave the reason. In the 1930s, the capitalists were still invested in the United States. This is true in the 40s, in the 50s, and the 60s. Uh, even as recently as I think uh, 15 or 20 years ago, 9% of the American economy w was um, uh, uh, produced in financial dealings. Now it's 40%. The capitalists have moved over from industrial of the manufacture and the selling of consumer goods to the shuffling of financial papers and they're finding it much easier and much more profitable. Incidentally, speaking of the CCC, I visited Denver about 30 years ago. Did anyone ever attend a rock concert at the Red Rocks Auditorium? They had this auditorium uh, in this open air auditorium on the slope of a hill and it's surrounded by these huge natural rocks. I think one of them is like 15 stories tall. A huge a phallus of red rock. It is beautiful. And when I saw on the sign a little plaque that it was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, again, sentimental fellow that I am, I cried because again I saw, the, uh, I, I was there enjoying this uh, amphitheater, and it was built by the kind of communal efforts you're calling for, were past that. Yes, uh, uh, we, we, we all know when we came in grammar school that the Octa came occupied two space, at the, a different space from the one there at the same time. Now, we know, and this ain't got no shit we make up. I'm saying I'm living, got good mind, I can see, they got television, they got... The government give hundreds, billions and billions of dollars every month. The guy come on the radio, the knacky, and say, I'm going to buy 70, 70 billion dollars a month to keep... Now, that's a lot of money. However, However, the money can't be here and over there at the same time. If you're giving it to Wall Street and all of the big time folks, how the hell you won't take care of the masses? Uh, you know, my hearing is failing me. Can you summarize this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody mentioned, before I ask the question, about what they could do for the people, like in 1930s when they had this and had that. But you can't put money here and over there at the same time. Well, and I'm so saying if anybody don't know that the government's giving away billions of dollars every month, where the fuck they been? Yeah, yeah. It's self-evident. Uh, this commentator, he used to be uh, an official of the, of the city government and uh, he was found guilty of something. He's out of jail now. He has a program with WCPT. He's a, a moderate or a conservative Democrat. He's blaming the, huh? Jim Lasky. Lasky, that's it, Jim Lasky. You can call it the Lasky Report. Today he was blaming the people, mostly in the ghetto, for doing a bad job of raising their children and this is the, he was saying, this is the, uh, the cause of uh, all, this, all this crime and, and, and murder. 
and he didn't breathe one word about the fact that, of course, the unemployment rate is actually about 14 percent, and but in the ghetto, it's 40 and 50 percent. And I described the plight of a young black man today. Uh, there are people who don't want to face certain realities. Just as I referred earlier to uh, Ibsen's play, An Enemy of the People, the people in that town didn't want to face the doctor's report that the hot springs that they were making so much money off of were poisonous and had to be closed down. They nearly lynched him. It was a movie with uh, Steve McLean, incidentally. So that's the country we're living in. We're living, uh, Mark Twain called it the United States of lynchardom. Uh, we need a different word. It's the United States of, uh, of, of illusion. That's Charles. Yeah, well, I remember seeing you on TV campaigning, but I don't recollect what, what let's say, if you had been elected, what were you planning oh, if to do been elected, in, yeah. in Congress? I, you know what I would do if I were in Congress? Here's what I would do. I would take uh, what I consider to be the most important legislation that I can think of, and it might be uh, this industrial mobilization plan to uh, produce uh, electric and solar and geothermal power, et cetera, and, and switch us off of oil pretty quickly I would go to the floor of the house and stay there until they arrest me and hope to wind up in jail and demonstrate to the country that the Congress, there's nothing to be hoped for from the Congress, something radically different has to be done. What will be done later, I don't know, but that would be more effective than trying to suck up to the even the Democratic uh, establishment in the house and get a good committee appointment and work for years to build up some kind of credit and then eventually get a bill passed that, that does one percent of the good that we need. That's what I would do. <clears throat> All right. Yes, Dorothy. I've heard you mention, I think, many times. Uh, can you, can you, can you talk a little louder? Yeah. I've heard you refer to the ghetto three times at least, mm -hmm. and that versus North Shore. What is your definition of a ghetto? Well, I think it's a very common phrase, and I think it's generally understood that it's that area of uh, black population which has virtually no whites in it and has a, a, a majority of blacks in poverty. So uh, it doesn't apply to Pill Hill as one example. Um, it, it doesn't apply to, uh, at least it didn't used to apply to the black areas of South Shore. Uh, but I see it as uh, the concentration of imposed disadvantage in this country. Uh, maybe aside from the American Indian, uh, no one has been more disadvantaged than the poor blacks who are living in the ghetto. And I see them as uh, in aid of a super duper Marshall Plan. Well, let, let me say this to you, to, just to clarify it for myself. Uh -huh. Driving through the ghetto. What? Driving through the ghetto oh, right. or driving through the north side. Uh -huh. If you slow up, driving through the north side, huh. just slow up, maybe looking for an address, you can be assured that there will be a police officer behind huh. you to ask you if you're lost. Oh, yeah. Okay. You can stop in what you call the ghetto, yeah. those black neighborhoods, take a piss, oh, yeah. and nobody will say anything. Yeah. So ghettos are created. Good. And I just wanted to clarify that because you made the distinction oh, a, a couple good point. times. That's a good point. Uh, can I be relieved that we do need to add any questions and let us switch to people making their own statements? Uh, 
somewhat of an anomaly. Now, what has happened is during the last five years, we had a major recession caused by Wall Street. But was it really Wall Street that did it? We had what we call the loosening of credit standards. A real loosening of credit standards where somebody who could basically lie about, lie about his income on a mortgage and get a loan, we set our own selves up for failure. Whether it be the banks or Wall Street or whoever, we had such easy credit for a long time that we all we're doing is just paying the bills for overspending during the late 90s and early 2000s. And I'm just as disgusted with the Republicans as I am the Democrats. Because what we don't have in this country is some sound fiscal discipline. Yes, people, we need tax money to pay for what government does. You cannot tax cut your way to prosperity. You need taxes and revenue to pay for the essential services that government does. Like me. He said essential. What we don't have now, and I think the way out of our debacle is not going to be new massive government spending on a Marshall Plan, but a simple getting our credit standards back in order, getting back to some sound basic business principles, and getting back to a little bit more of a capitalistic system and get rid of this monopolistic system that we have right now. And you know something? We did it 150 years ago. It was called the antitrust laws. Teddy Roosevelt broke up a lot of the major American monopolies back in the late 1900s that were causing a lot of hard-working people to be living basically at starvation wages. And Charlie, it was also your unions that caused a lot of the rise in those wages. Ultimately, what it's going to go down to is, some, is getting back to some basic market fundamentals. If there's a need, we need to fill it. Right now, we have a basic need for a new source of energy. And... There's an equation called E equals MC squared. Energy equals the matter times the speed of light squared. It's called nuclear power. And there are ways to make that kind of power safe if we let the genie of innovation out again. It's going to require a major retooling of our oil-based economy and infrastructure in order to really change over to a more electrical based, whether it be through renewables or anything else, but it can be done by industry, pending they see a profitable model on it. 
Now, government has had a centralized role in basic research for a long time and in basically providing the seed capital for industries to start prospering. If you remember, the Transcontinental Railroad was largely financed by the land grants that the government was giving the railroads. Wow. Um, and there was also a lot of infrastructure with credit through the Credit Mobilier and some of the larger corporations going through. Charlie, you can correct me on this later on. But there was a lot of government support. Even our present in internet was basically started by government research through ARPANET and the basic infrastructure being laid out and later on letting private industry come in on a basic platform and innovating. We also had a good deal with our phone company for many, many years with AT&T. They had to provide universal service in order to make sure everybody was connected. What is our solution going forward? Personally, I think if we get rid of the welfare to the corporations, and that means a, getting rid of all the handouts for everything from the farm bill to, you know, TIF districts and everything else, still maintaining some kind of safety net for some of our more basic under people, under underappreciated people, and if we have to raise taxes enough to pay for essential government services, amongst which is health care. We don't have a debate now about basic police and basic fire protection. But at one time, they too were privatized and manipulated. But we found that it was much better to let them become a public good. Our roads, our bridges are a public good. And perhaps maybe health care should be changed to some kind of public good. How we pay for it? Well, it's crazy. In the United States right now, we're paying more administrative costs for health care than any other country in the world. And perhaps maybe this Obamacare plan might be a good step in the right direction to get health care as a public good. Also at the same time, we're going to have to pay for these public goods. And that means an elimination of tax loopholes, reform of our tax codes so that everybody who makes money pays their fair share. But also, at the same time, you have to get rid of some other things that will bring to unleash, or to unleash the engine of capitalism. It's always been a three-pronged approach. Government, the people, and business. If anybody gets too much power, it, the system breaks down. Right now, there is a little too much power in some of our major banks and corporations, and perhaps they need to be reined in through antitrust legislation. There was a time when government had a little too much power in the economy during the 60s, which led to a wash of deregulation. And at times, for a brief period, there were even some times when the employees had a little too much power over the corporations. We need a balance. We need the law and the people to work for us, not against us. When you give the game to one specific set of people, there is always going to be some form of politic of power being corrupted. I'll take you back to a well-known phrase by one of our founding fathers, absolute power corrupts absolutely. What we need to do again is get back to some of the principles that made America great. We need to make things again. We need to innovate again. And that innovation is probably going to be coming through more and more information technology, more and more development of alternative energy sources and power. And folks, like it or not, I still believe that globalization was one of the best things that ever happened around the world. The results are in the pan. Less people in poverty today than ever before. We have three-fifths of the world making and are out of poverty 
two fists are still there, but it's changing fast. Okay, Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, Dora, she, uh, slipping my memory, Tim is back because I believe that was Jim that said our founding fathers uh, corrupt, absolute corrupt. Absolute corrupt. power corrupts absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, I ain't trying to show you up and I ain't trying to show you about how no, smart I am. But that wasn't our founding fathers. It was England's yes, founding fathers. Okay. And if there's a dispute, it's dispute between Lord Acton yeah. and yeah. Edmund Book. There you go. Some and I stand say Edmund corrected. Huh? I stand corrected. Thank okay. You. Well, I'm going to correct you on this, too. Okay. Because when I was coming out of Washington, it sounded like you said that the public, you know, the general population is greed, was greedy, and they was buying what they couldn't afford and blah, blah, blah. To me, that comes out of Orwell's 1984 which the big brothers say, two and two is five. And Winston Smith said, no, no, no. He said, no, two and two is five. And he wasn't joking, he was serious. He didn't mean that literally, but he did mean that under the system that they had and what they were there for and what they was gonna be about. Two and two is five. And if somebody gonna sit here and say, that the public, the responsible for the financial collapse all over the world, got to be saying two and two is five. No, I didn't. I say mean, that. it's no secret. They use words like toxic asset. Who made that up? Somebody living in Inglewood? They got they got words like they got words like uh, uh, derivatives. Who made that up? Is somebody in Inglewood? Yeah. This shit came right out of the Federal Reserve collude with AIG and AIG in Wall Street, big corporation, banks merging with the big gambling houses on Wall Street. These people in, in the library is full of sauces. This ain't Gene Anderson mm -hmm. saying this shit. You go to the library, you can find 200 books telling you that the Federal Reserve sit there and allowed to bank, and, and by the way, if you don't know it, the Federal Reserve is supposed to supervise the bank. Yes. I, otherwise, I, I, I rank the bank, and they sat there and let Wall Street and, 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 and the uh, 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 Bear Stern and, and, and the Lehman Brothers or whoever they are do what the hell they want. The term uh, predatory lending, that's, that's something that the public didn't say or uh, bait up. This shit was introduced at the highest level for their benefit. They used the housing thing to make trillions of dollars that they got. That somebody mentioned that, the speaker. They got warehouses all over the world with hundred dollar bills stacked up all over the goddamn world. They running off the printing press seven days a week, 24 hours a goddamn day. And that ain't what I'm making up. That's what they were doing. And that's why we, the government, the people's end up with $15 trillion worth of toxic asset. And that's why Bernanke goes out every month and spends $700 billion, no, I believe, no, Eight. $70 billion, $70 billion dollars to prop up who? Me and you and them people that get foreclosure, some people that have lost their home, they propping up Wall Street in the bank, like the speaker said, got more money in the history of the world. And they the never had the amount of money now uh, uh, that they ever had in the history of the world. Only somebody that suffered is the person that lost their home, the person that's looking for a job, and the people that don't know any better. That's who suffered. And this is how can somebody stand here and blame anybody except the people that runs it? Now back to another thing that I can't stand. I almost want to peep, puke when people are talking about, like my friend North over there, talking about we elected so and so. We do we voted a mean. Your vote don't mean a motherfucking thing. <laughs> Your vote don't mean you ain't I threw my card away eight years ago. Why? Because I was like St. Paul. I once was a child. I thought as a child. Act like I'm grown now. Fuck y'all. Y'all ain't gonna play me. If I want a joke, I would go to Second City and hang out over there where they cracking jokes and shit. So I'm gonna waste my time to hope. Oh, hey. You give me Ike and Mike, 
that got that works for you and tell me well you vote for well you the hell I give me a power to vote for your monkey ass you run the world <laughs> And if I can't vote for your monkey ass, then you using me and everybody else. And some people stand up here, including the speaker, he did that, you know, if he was win, he would do this, and he would, you would do just what all them other assholes do. You would, if you don't, if you don't let them back you, then you ain't gonna have no power to do shit. You one push. The president is one push. First of all, he works for the people that selected him. I'm telling y'all people, I ain't know I came out the cotton field. But I was here when this lie was told, and I was here when the deception was there. I was here when the trick was played, and I was here when they said two and two is motherfucking five. I'm not going to accept that because I know that. And the truth, don't scare me. The truth set you free. And if you got eyes and ears and things, a, a brain, my auntie used to say, boy, use your head for more than a head wrap. <laughs> That's what people gonna have to do. Use the head for more than a head wrap. And first of all, they got to get some nerve. <laughs> when you get some nerve to seek the goddamn truth, I mean, who, who, what, what's so frightened about the goddamn truth? If you, if you ain't got no government, then you ain't got no, your vote don't count. If you ain't, if your government hijacked, and somebody running your government, he running your senator, he running your representative, he running the dude sitting over there that, that, that call himself the, like the, uh, in, whatever, regulator. He, he acts and your president. So, I mean, I don't understand that. I mean, it's so clear that a blind man can't see, a blind man can see and the fool would even stumble if he walked to, walk to, uh, to water. And some of these people sat around and told me, let's do this, and yo, I'm going to vote this, go to call your senator. Call. You ain't got no goddamn senator. How many times do I have to say that? Your, 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 your country your, your has been hijacked. And it wasn't hijacked yesterday. It was hijacked. I would say, if I want to put date on it, I would say they hijacked it after World War II. And they really got down when they got the people lined up like they wanted, maybe like when they brought in Reagan and, and they lined this up and they lined that up. And they really got it. And I'm telling y'all, take your, your, they got that big old bird that be in the sand, take, they had their head in the dirt. I think some of these people got their ass in the dirt. <laughs> Okay. Hey everybody, my name is Doug Binkley, as you know, um, it's good uh, getting together with uh, everybody on the issues of the day here. Um, I think that uh, Mo Shanfield was right about um, the uh, case, uh, pretty much um, um, another um, couple friends that have been here a good while, We, uh, uh, Don Ritchie and uh, Tom Durkin. Uh, and uh, I uh, was there, I think Ernie was there too, um, when we were discussing the Zimmerman case. So. And uh, uh, yeah, it's fairly clear that the uh, prosecutor sabotaged the case. Uh, um, it is possible there was a third um, charge that could have been brought that was less than manslaughter and the jury might have gone for that. It's also possible the prosecutor with making better decisions could have gotten the manslaughter verdict. Um, the issue of the stand your ground didn't actually come up in the case, but it, the self-defense was implicitly in the uh, defense, as Mo points out. So uh, you can't know exactly <clears throat> what happened since the altercation between uh, Trevon and uh, Zimmerman wasn't videotaped. and. Um, the evidence uh, is inconclusive, as they say, although uh, Mo makes a point that it couldn't have been exactly the way Zimmerman described it. Um, but um, even if it was, uh, it's clear that he must have initiated the uh, uh, altercation. Uh, Trevon probably did do something that was unwise uh, since he was walking while black. And, uh, 
that yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, racism, of course, um, uh, is a very terrible problem in this country. Um, the uh, it we don't know for sure because we can't get into Zimmerman's head whether it uh, affected the situation on that night, but. Uh, it's a good probability that it did. Um, but that's kind of beside the point, because um, if um, um, Trevon had been a young punk, um, the, whole, the thing still could have happened. He might have ended up dead. Um, the real, one of the tragedies, uh, I can't mention everything, <clears throat> because there's so many aspects of this case, but one of the tragedies is that <clears throat> if Zimmerman had simply been carrying a non-lethal weapon, and had used a taser on, um, on uh, Trevon, whether he was on top of him, beneath him, or 20 feet away from him, um, Trevon would probably not be dead today. Um, and a non-lethal weapon would have probably satisfied Zimmerman's uh, thoughts of grandiosity or whatever it was, um, egotism, that uh, caused him to be so-called uh, neighborhood, neighborhood watch. Uh, so I mentioned this once before when we had a similar topic here um, that uh, I don't really know why there isn't um, more interest in people carrying non-lethal weapons. Um, I personally have thought about it. I don't actually know what the laws in the city are. I have a feeling that they uh, would uh, <laughs> not want to let me carry one for whatever reason, simply because the police like to keep a monopoly on things. But since the uh, um, law is going to have to be changed now to uh, uh, not conflict with the Second Amendment and people are supposed to be able to carry uh, lethal weapons soon in this state, legally. Uh, I don't really see why there isn't a push to uh, make it possible for civilians to carry non-lethal weapons. Uh, personally, uh, um, I would much rather if I was um, attacked and had uh, uh, no way to flee, uh, use a non-lethal weapon on my attacker rather than have to use a lethal weapon. Um, so um, I, would, I would push, and I've thought about it, uh, for some kind of a citizen's uh, uh, initiative to try to uh, uh, educate people that uh, maybe um, carrying non-lethal weapons is uh, a possible response to this proliferation of, uh, of lethal weapons in our city. Now, uh, um, I don't really know uh, how much more time I have, but um, um, racism is a terrible thing. Um, police violence is a terrible thing. Uh, I watch uh, MSNBC a lot, uh, and um, they mentioned uh, just this morning, um, I think it was on Melissa Harris Perry's show, uh, that uh, there's a gentleman named John, Jonathan Farrell, uh, either, either in North Carolina or South Carolina recently. Um, he was involved in a uh, car accident while driving while black, and uh, he got out of the car, uh, just barely, you know, um, injured. Um, he had to kick out the back window, and he dragged himself to a, uh, uh, a rural, rural house where there was a white woman with her um, child. It was two in the morning. He knocked on the door, hoping for, you know, some help. I guess his cell phone, maybe he lost it in the car, maybe he was... Uh, again, being black, maybe he didn't have enough money for a cell phone, whatever. Um, it's a pity that um, this white woman, um, she opened the door, there was a black person there. She slammed the door and called 911 and said, there's a black man trying to break, break into my house. <clears throat> the police uh, arrived and of course being police, um, they decided um, that they found this black man walking on her property and of course he wasn't supposed to be there, I guess, you know, he should have just stayed in his car until a patrol car came along uh, maybe the next day and found him uh, dead. That's what he should have done. But uh, they found him walking on her property and uh, one of them shot him with a taser and then the other one decided to shoot him with 12 bullets. <laughs> so he actually um, uh, died. So. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what time this happened, but I hadn't heard about this, and uh, unless it gets in big in the media, you're not going to hear about it. But his name is Jonathan Farrell, and he was murdered by uh, police uh, in either North Carolina or South Carolina. I mean, I don't know what else to sugarcoat it. 
that's a pretty pretty clear case. You know, one, one officer shoots him with a taser and the other one decides to shoot him with 12 bullets. I mean, that's, by my mind, that's murder. That's not manslaughter. That's simply murder. And I don't know the race of the officers, but it's a... Um, the, the, at least the victim was black. Okay, I'll close with that. And they don't just happen in North and South Carolina. They have so all over the United States. One of those Carolinas. All right, well, some time back, I made two predictions regarding the uh, Zimmerman Trayvon Martin case. I was wrong on one, and I was right on the other. Uh, I predicted that when it went to trial, Zimmerman would be acquitted. I was right on that. I predicted, however, that the demonstrations, which, which early on had been peaceful, would not be peaceful, that they would be violent after his acquittal. Fortunately, so far, I've been wrong uh, on that one. But uh, I, I want to preface my remarks with a couple of, of things. Oh, there's a little cliche which occasionally has been going around about this case, which I'll throw out now. Uh, never before has a Hispanic killed a black man and white people have been blamed. Okay, that's what uh, some people are saying about this case because, of course, Zimmerman uh, actually is Hispanic, although we talk about him as if he was white. He was raised by white, white people, but he's uh, actually Hispanic. Uh, I want to say I have no particular love specifically for George Zimmerman. He obviously is a guy with a lot of problems. He's a wannabe cop, which is maybe the most dangerous kind of cop. And uh, he, he would he tried to get jobs with several police departments in the area. He was turned down because he had anger management problems. And of course, there was a case just recently where he was apparently flaunting a gun uh, with his ex or his wife who's divorcing him. So he, he clearly is not a, 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 a great guy. He's not going to be the Chamber of Commerce Man of the Year anywhere. The other thing that should be said is that Sanford, Florida, is a multiracial, not biracial, multiracial community. The uh, area, the community, the gated community in which uh, this incident took place uh, was also multiracial. The police department in Sanford uh, is it Sanford, I guess it is, is, is multiracial. Uh, at least one of the officials there is Hispanic, and somebody early on wanted to charge Zimmerman right away, but they were overruled. Now, here's, here's, why, here's where some of the racist elements come in and, and why I think they did that. Uh, they, first of all, I think there was a little feeling that Zimmerman, even though he was not a real cop, was uh, kind of one of them, so they wanted to do whatever reasonably they could do to help him. Uh, uh, second of all, uh, they, they realized that this was a very uh, uh, emotional case and would have a lot of international implications, and our speaker uh, alluded to that, that there could be a lot of damage uh, to the state of Florida and to their community and so forth over this case. So they didn't charge him right away. They hoped it would go away. Well, it didn't. They waited 44 days and finally they did charge him. I think one of the reasons that they didn't charge him is they knew what the, how the case was made up. They knew what evidence was there, what evidence was, was not going to go to trial and so forth. They pretty well knew that if this thing went to trial that Zimmerman was going to be acquitted. And they thought this would create even more problems than not charging him in the first place. Well, they finally decided, no, we've got to charge him, and they did, and then the case started to uh, uh, to roll forward. And ultimately, uh, he was acquitted. He was acquitted because the evidence presented uh, in both sides, the defense and the prosecution, pretty much knew what the other side had and what their case was going to be uh, before they ever went to trial. Uh, and they pretty well knew that, uh, that there was going to be an acquittal here. Uh, and this, of course, they knew would, would, would create some problems. Now, I think where, where it becomes uh, a case of uh, the prosecutors uh, going too far to help Zimmerman is they charged him with second-degree murder. 
and I don't have a full understanding. We had a little discussion on that earlier. I think they knew full well that they were not going to get an, uh, a conviction for second degree murder. They didn't go for manslaughter or violating the rights of a minor or any of the other several things they could have gone for early on. Uh, because they knew that he would probably be convicted on one of those and would have ended up spending some time in jail. Uh, <clears throat> at the very end, for those of you who follow the trial, uh, you'll, you may remember that at the very end the judge kind of threw something out. She said, well, you don't have to just go for second degree murder. He said that she said this to the jury. You can go for manslaughter and then this other charge about violating the rights of the minor, I don't remember it the exact uh, description of that charge. And this is the point at which uh, Zimmerman's attorney said this is the most bizarre case he's ever been involved in. Well, which, you know, the defense attorney is going to say something like that. But I really think, I think they should, they overcharged him knowing that he would be acquitted. And I think they may have done this intentionally. Uh, that's, that's kind of my take on the whole thing. Um, one of the jurors later uh, said that she would have, uh, you know, look, reviewing it again in her mind, she would, uh, she would have convicted uh, on man, on man's uh, slaughter. And one of the things which which is somebody just alluded to here, uh, as much of a tragedy as it is, Trayvon probably contributed uh, to the outcome by his behavior. And nobody, no, everybody seems to gloss over this. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened because we don't have, we only have a couple of witnesses who saw them in the dark and this and that. We have the phone recordings and so forth. By the way, I wish Don Ritchie were here because Don Ritchie really studied this case more than anybody I know. He listened to the tapes, which are on YouTube, all of the recordings with the police department, uh, and the transcripts of the recordings with the girlfriend and all of the witness testimony and the police reports. Don went through this with a fine tooth comb. He just took an interest in it and could probably contribute something to this discussion, but he's in Virginia now. Um, so anyway, those were the main points uh, that I wanted to uh, bring out. Oh, uh, our speaker said something about the big white guy, Zimmerman, going after this uh, teenager. Trayvon, as it turns out, is six foot three and somewhat athletic, and uh, Zimmerman is five foot ten. Weights weighed more than Trayvon, but I think, like a lot of us that are a little older, a lot of it was down here, not up here. So, so, uh, so Trayvon probably did have a physical uh, advantage there, and unfortunately, we'll probably never know. Maybe George Zimmerman, on his deathbed, will tell us what really happened. But other than that. I think we'll never know what really uh, happened. Uh, our speaker made a re remark too on a different topic, why, why carry guns, alluding to the concealed carry. Uh, you know, I could stand up here and talk about that for another 10 minutes, so I will just uh, maybe talk to the speaker alone afterwards. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, well I had car trouble, so. I didn't hear the speech, but uh, truth be told, it doesn't break my heart. It's sort of almost disappointing to hear that anybody, as according to Ernie, would have been going over this this case with a fine-tooth comb, as Ernie indicates his friend has done. And, it, and it's just it's it's a shame, as far as I'm concerned, that this country can get so wrapped up in things like this. This is sort of like OJ. Revisited. <laughs> Although I'll grant, at least in this case, the issues of concealed carry and so on are at least of somewhat greater. But you're walking through airports. Pardon? But you're walking through airports. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm losing you. <laughs> I'm not denunciating this all. I'm walking through airports. Okay, whatever. Okay. Anyway. Uh, yeah, well, all right. So it's worth talking about. With all the blanket media coverage, I tuned it out as much as I possibly could. Um, nonetheless, I would have thought I would have caught some sort of glimpse of what Doug referred to in talking about non-lethal weapons. Did I miss a bunch in the mainstream media, or has there been nothing? I, I never heard of 
How, almost anyone talk okay. about non-lethal yeah. weapons uh, in yeah. which, There space. you go, yeah, there you, isn't that really why, something? Why wasn't he carrying a non-lethal yeah. weapon? Yeah, 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 why not have that as part of the broad discussion? But yet, evidently, with all the blanket coverage, well, nothing right, about that. Right? So even when they get an opportunity I'm, I'm in the media You're okay? to do some sort of justice to some consideration other than the absolute most obvious considerations, yeah, here we go, they drop the ball in what presumably is the most famous case of the decade so far. They still drop the ball. They get their paychecks from the yeah. semester. Well, geez, you know. Well, that's, no. That's, <clears throat> the, this, this, like the OJ thing, in its way, and I'm hearing this, is this, whole, this case, and the way the media's been handling this case is a microcosm of what's happening in the country here. You had uh, Dorothy, talking earlier about, well, it's not about race, it's about individuals. Well, whatever it is, is it worth talking about to anything like the extent that it's been talked about, particularly in so far as it's been talked about so badly from what is emerging just here from Doug about what they're not talking about that they could have talked about. And this, and in turn, this goes into many of the comments of Gene as to the whole 1984-ish mentality that's mass-produced in this country. There was a time when the media, you know, there were a bunch of dudes called muckrakers, all right? And off and on throughout the history of the printed word in the literal sense of printing, starting with Martin Luther, you've had whistleblowers being able to get a word in edgewise in the public debate. But now, thanks to the boob tube, that is pretty well ended. And uh, Gene mentioned at the end of World War II and Reagan, and I think he's on the right track. I'm really tempted to say the emergence of cable TV made a big difference here. Once you've got 24-7 news coverage, you had more time than ever, but you've had very arguably less substance than ever. And but what that stuff and what 24-7 what, what cable TV ended up doing, I suspect, among other things, was get people to think that they were actually getting something worth getting. And so if anything, they've been reading less. The papers have been dying off, but the cable networks have been relatively, my sense of it, is going fairly strong. And so, you know, you've got, you've got a, a public which with respect to virtually all of the issues that matter, is just more ignorant than ever. And so they might know a whole shitload about OJ or Trayvon up one side and down the other, but do they know anything else of any importance? I fear not. And so what's going on, as Gene was driving to, is that, yeah, your vote doesn't mean anything. It's got no chance to mean anything. Whether you vote for monkey ass number one or monkey ass number two, no, uh, it's, 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 it's a waste of time. The alternatives that need to be there aren't there. And they're not going to be there until such time, if it were ever to happen, that the media that are consumed by most Americans would give the alternative views the time of day. When, they, when, the, when the media can't even bother to give simple consideration to a simple alternative of non-lethal weapons on this super high profile issue in this super high profile case, how can we expect them to do any sort of justice to less than super high profile issues? So, you know, the, the people, yeah, the people are, are ignorant. They're not dumb, but they're ignorant. And they're going to stay ignorant until some massive change occurs in the system such that someone gets their attention and takes the trouble to inform them in ways that matter and are helpful. Thank you, I'll thank our speaker for bringing up some uh, really interesting questions uh, about the uh, reconstitution of uh, private militias uh, and, and enabled with uh, police powers under stand your ground laws. Uh, it's uh, a little frightening, but it is a possibility. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and not uh, when we uh, are a little paranoid, sometimes uh, uh, we uh, are a little more realistic uh, than uh, than when we are realistic. Uh, the realistic takes what obtains and uh, tries uh, to uh, build upon it. Uh, the uh, paranoid uh, imagines what could obtain uh, out of fear and, and uh, very often uh, uh, the fears become the reality and uh, people build on the realities uh, that, uh, that actually happens. Uh, so, I uh, guess there are lots of things that can happen, and uh, Alec uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, their sponsorship of Stand Your Ground, Stand Your Ground Laws uh, uh, may uh, be uh, uh, the uh, paranoid uh, uh, vision of the future that may actually come to obtain, uh, but uh, I don't uh, know when I, when I read uh, statistics like uh, but the uh, well, what did I read? Five, the five largest uh, U.S. banks. Uh, hold uh, $300 trillion uh, uh, worth of uh, uh, somewhat toxic uh, 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 bonds and, and uh, securities, uh, uh, I, I, I say, well, yes, maybe there is a possibility of the whole system collapsing. Uh, but I notice uh, that uh, in the uh, Great Depression uh, that we experienced in the 30s, uh, the, uh, the capitalist class were uh, willing to put up with 90% uh, 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 income taxes. Uh, of course, uh, when you have tax accountants and tax lawyers, you can always figure uh, how little income uh, you've got. Uh, and 90% uh, of nothing uh, is still nothing. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not too sure, uh, even when, when we tax the very rich at 90%, uh, uh, that uh, we're always going to get uh, the uh, well-funded corporations uh, to uh, contribute to munificently. Uh, well, but the real point is that uh, neither the Green Party, which comes closest to it, uh, is any uh, political organization that obtains, or any other uh, political uh, alliance uh, has agitated for the real employment of the unemployed during the last five years. And that's a complete lack of vision on the left in the United States. So uh, I wonder what hope there is. And when it comes uh, to the racism that, that continues and continues, it's uh, a, uh, an inexhaustible fight. But uh, nevertheless, there are battles that are won. And I don't agree at all with uh, the, uh, the solution of burning your your uh, voter's registration card. Uh, that's uh, giving the white citizens councils 
uh, a, a, uh, I'm more on the side of Medgar Evers uh, than, uh, than our anarchist friends. Okay, uh, those are my observations. All right, you guys are putting me to sleep. <laughs> I read today that one third of the people in the United States, at least among the younger upcoming generation, uh, profess they have no religious affiliation. That's the problem. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's why you got shootings. Corporate theft, it explains it all. Same sex. Yeah. Anyhow, does. first of all, let's thank it our does. speaker again. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Mo, for kicking off the discussion here. I'll be eclectic as usual. To me, this Zimmerman thing was an alleged incident. I really don't study these things, these crimes of the century. We get little, a few bits of news. Uh, you have to sit through the entire, you're a lawyer, you've got to go through the whole thing, the whole, to have a full and complete comprehension and understanding in order to make an assessment. Anybody who does so without having sat through the entire proceedings is operating on only percentage of the information. And it's not valid to make any conclusions, certainly not, you know, whether or not this is a statement of society and what have you. But uh, nevertheless, we, actually these crimes, I, the one I actually I was following was that crazy girl that killed her boyfriend. That, well, I forget her name, She, what happened to her. She kept changing the story and things like this. But uh, that one I, I found some interest in. But yeah, we get a little bit of information on this, and I don't think anything is is really valid on this. Um, the other thing, actually, I, I, I the other day I was in Books a Million, and I was surprised they they still have a section in the back. I found these paperback books called True Crime, <laughs> which are really strange. I was going out with a girl, and her father loved to read these things, and he gave me all of them. They're really peculiar genre, which a lot of people don't know about. But um, honestly, I even someone as seriously like Donald, uh, I, it's difficult to get a full and complete understanding of what actually took place in this situation here. We even have one where we actually only have one individual that knows what actually happened. Uh, and you have to rely on him. That's all you can go by are some sort of evidence that you gather in that regard, you know. Now regarding police brutality, we have some veterans here of the police force in attendance tonight. Uh, having been engaged with the police since the protest in 68 for a number of years, I can certainly attest to the validity that they have very, they, they've got anger management problems. <laughs> Especially when my pals and I took the Tribune Tower in the name of the people one time. <laughs> um, actually, the other thing I like to watch, I just, it's the only television I, I started watching. I do they call it DI or something, where they have these really bad crimes, like some wife plugs her husband. And, uh, they're not really detective shows because they're simple crimes for how they solve them. But um, people, uh, tragically, the, take situations into their own things and try to extricate themselves from relationships and through violence, you know, like that. Um, the gun issue is, I think, the central thing in this. Uh, without getting into the alleged incident, uh, what what a neighborhood watch guy is doing with weaponry, I'm, I was somewhat surprised. I signed up to be a neighborhood watch in New York, but they just gave us walkie-talkies. They didn't give us, you know, weaponry. And there certainly were very well-defined perimeters on what 
you could or should do under those circumstances. Uh, there's two things here regarding the guns as well. Uh, you hit on it a little bit here. You've got, uh, first we had originally the Castle Doctrine, which you're familiar with, and you're authorized to use weapons here. And now it's been expanded in what I would term enabling legislation into the stand your ground concept. So it's been expanded in that regard, which I certainly hope my loony neighbor is not aware <laughs> of his hand enhanced ability to use the weaponry. Uh, but yes, it is an expansion on a concept. Uh, certainly the gun community. I, you may not be aware of it. I get any sort, a half dozen or more gun advocates send me hate mail all the time. As a matter of fact, even one guy was the only person I had to get cancel out of my receiving emails because he kept sending me advertisements for guns and he went kind of bizarre. Um, and I finally had to blacklist him. From, it just got out of hand. Um, the, but anyhow, we got gone over my loony neighbor. That's, that's kind of the things here. I think guns in the community, violence in the community. I've been trying to, I've been on the issue of getting rid of guns altogether. I don't think they should be in the hands of certainly quasi-policemen or conditional policemen. I don't know what that is, what status, what he was even doing with the weapon, but I guess it's become a hazardous occupation even to be a neighborhood watch person. Um, the incident that concerned me somewhat more regarding weaponry on a larger scale was the one in the naval yard uh, where you had this guy, apparently because he was getting bombarded with microwave energy, proceeded to do in a number of his co-workers. Uh, these are the incidences that really concern me much more so than Zimmerman. Uh, violence in the workplace is something that and we're only a year away from uh, the first anniversary of the shooting in Connecticut. And the gun lobby has managed to curtail any sort of control on the extent of violence in our community with weaponry. Uh, certainly another one, just the incident here the other day in the park, not far from me as a matter of fact, uh, is a case of much more concern. Uh, what are people going in, kids, kids going in the parks and plugging everyone there? This is really getting out of hand. Anyhow, the other thing I wanted to say is, I, and I don't really know what happened in between these two fellows on the street, but my own thing, recommendation is, if you are confronted by anyone in these situations, do not challenge them. And I mean that. I represent security guards and Federal Protective Office, Department of Homeland Security. And even though I know them on a first name basis and they're co-workers, when they get into an official capacity, um, I do not challenge them, even if it's a store guard or anything like that. Uh, comply with their request. It's like in the workplace we say, do it and grieve. Uh, appeal it later. Don't try to adjudicate it on the street. Now, I got in a little argument with the railroad club the other day, and why would I get in an argument at the railroad club? <laughs> well, I go around photographing public transportation and transportation things, and I get confronted all the time. The all sorts of people, Amtrak security people, uh, CTA police, even Philly police out of town, what are you up to? What are you doing? And if they tell me to go, I go. You know, I don't. And the guy said, oh, take out a piece of paper and a pen and get their name and badge number. I said, oh, that's brilliant. That's really, I said, no, I'm not, oh, I want your name, buddy. 
<laughs> you know, I said, oh, that's really one way to get to make friends and influence people, right? You know, I want your badge number, <laughs> you know, start writing it down. No, I don't confront them even under any circumstances because uh, you don't know yes, what they're, where they're coming from. They may have legitimate concerns or experiences and it's best if you have some difficulty to adjudicate it later. The last thing I got to talk about on a more positive note, he talked about these convoys of grain and having lived in rural areas in Kansas, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't, that's a standard thing this time of year. The harvest is in progress. And if you know, you have a combine. And very often these combines, they can even operate at night. And they have custom harvesters. And they come along and they're, 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 this is, this is no fluent time of the year. And they come along and your combine gets full and you load the crane into the truck and it's and it's, it's taken to the silo. And I don't know if you can extrapolate anything like that. I've never heard of convoys or things of that nature. Maybe agri business has gotten it, but they're moving at a clip. They're moving and these guys really move. They do not stop. And I don't know if you can say anything about it. It's rather intriguing. If you ever seen these operations, I they have participated in it. The harvest time is serious business in in the rural communities, and uh, when they're pulling in the corn and the wheat, you know, and they're loading up these trucks and they're they're going to storage. Then uh, I've never heard of them pulling the other vehicles over. The only time I've heard that is if they put them on flatbed trucks, because it's kind of dangerous. Because these combines weigh like a million pounds. And I would not recommend ever getting in front of one. Like, well, yeah, it's probably a good idea because they can't stop. I mean, they're overloaded and things like that. And they go from one farm to the next. They start like down in Texas, at least the wheat boys, and work their way north. You know, things like that. But anyhow, thanks a lot. No, let me know when you got another one in you. By the way, we got a lot of schedules here, so I get a take some time. Yes, sir. You get last, last. You get last shot, buddy. Okay. <laughs> This is here with my combine. My money. What did you say about the combine? Don't interfere, don't stop me. I want to start out by handing out a couple of awards. Uh, Ernie offered the best rebuttal in detail of the evidence I was presenting. And I can see that he studied the trial more carefully than I did. Um, Graham offered the best rebuttal of my fundamental thesis. And that's what a rebuttal really should be. My fundamental thesis is um, that uh, maybe in a symbolic and metaphorical way as well as an actual way, the Zimmerman trial and verdict. Thank you. The Zimmerman trial and verdict uh, serve as an omen of uh, future crises in a society where there will be intense conflict among the civilian population. Uh, now Charlie said, so that, uh, when you want to rebut something, now I didn't, maybe I didn't sharpen up my thesis enough, uh, but if I were running the College of Complexes, I would require every speaker to summarize what his thesis is and require that uh, the rebut each rebuttal will be directed toward refuting the thesis. Oh, no. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And try oh, okay. to do it every week. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, this ain't no best. <laughs> All right. I'm voted down on that one. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. But anyhow, uh, Charlie said that we have to rely on the one guy who was there with the implication that we don't know anything. Charlie, I'm sorry. We know a lot. First of all, George Zimmerman's pistol, or automatic, whatever it was, m matched up with the bullet in uh, Trayvon Martin. Secondly, uh, George Zimmerman told the police that he shot Trayvon Martin. We have circumstantial evidence, we have testimony. There wasn't anyone else, 
no one suggested there was anyone else around with a gun who could have done that. Um, no, so, no. so you can't say, I don't know what happened on the street, only in the sense, you, right now we don't know that England exists, maybe it was just uh, destroyed by, by the Lord. Uh, but uh, using, ordinary, using ordinary processes of reasoning, we have a very good idea what happened oh. between those two people. And uh, an unarmed man was shot, and this had to be accounted for in law. Now, uh, Ernie did a good job of presenting counter evidence that other things were going on among the, uh, the prosec prosecutorial um, authorities, and I, I would have some dispute with him about some of his conclusions, but uh, he was really trying to uh, refute uh, my evidence for my thesis, and Bram was uh, saying that um, uh, what you were saying reminded me at one point of the old saying from the 60s, I think it was a button, paranoids have real enemies too. Um, and you were dealing with that issue. Of, uh, and this is where American exceptionalism comes in. Since the Civil War, we've had a, a, a fairly peaceful country, and we have come to the conclusion that the system that we have, the economic, the social, political system, is going to continue basically the same way it has been continuing. Um, so that when people raise um, issues of, uh, of the threat of various crises like global warming, uh, uh, decline in oil production, uh, most people don't even hear it. It's just like the emperor's new clothes. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, reality and necessity and the, uh, the welfare of our grandchildren require that we look at things a little bit more objectively than the people in, um, in An Enemy of the People uh, by Ibsen. Uh, Madison gave us a very good formula for these things. He said, uh, we did not revolt when our last liberty was taken from us. We revolted when our first liberty was threatened. There's lots of threats to more than just our liberty, threats to our survival. And whether it takes a revolt or whether it takes a more scientific approach to energy production, we have to uh, use Madison's standard of responding to a threat. Now, I can point to 10 different threats, such as global warming and the, res the resulting hurricanes and droughts and floods and so forth and so on. If you have 10 threats, uh, ten threats of disaster, and there's only a 5% probability, say within the next 10 years, and there's only a 5% probability for any one of those threats occurring, just according to the laws of statistics, the odds are 50-50 that one of those ten threats will occur in that next 10 years. And that's the situation we're in, and that's the situation to which we have to apply Madison Standard. Thank you. We're out of here, right? right. I want to thank everybody for coming. for your participation in the discussion. We've all been a little bit enlightened, perhaps. <laughs>